I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as you do this, I want to explain to you where we're going for these next few weeks. There is an important number. Scripture is full of important numbers. Three is a sacred number. Seven is an important number. We see that all throughout Scripture. Um, there, in, a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about the number eight in Scripture. Today and for these next few weeks, though, I want to put two numbers in your mind. The first is the number 40. The second is the number 10. You see, we didn't come to Easter and arrive at Easter and then discard Easter. Here's the thing about resurrection is when Jesus was raised, he was raised to life forever. So Easter is not a day. Easter is an event. And the event of Easter continues well beyond the day. So every Sunday we gather on the Lord's Day. This was used to be kind of like Monday. In the ancient world, Sabbath was on Saturday, and, uh, and so Sunday was the beginning of the work week, yet the early church changed their meeting time to coordinate with when Christ arose. They called it the Lord's Day, and we still meet on that time, and every time we meet on Sunday, we are proclaiming the Lord's resurrection. That's why I say this, and I'll, I, I'm hoping you will respond. That's why I say to the church often, Christ is risen. This is our affirmation. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his disciples 40 days. I want to explain to you some of what this number means. If you go all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, what you'll find is that God rained down, we won't call, him, call it a blessing, but he rained down literally upon the earth. The surface, the, the waters of the deep um, began to bubble up and the, the earth was flooded. Noah, uh, Noah was on the ark, his family, eight of them together, but that rain came for 40 days. You see, 40 is a, day, is a time of preparation. And in this instance, God was preparing the earth for a cleansing. A cleansing. 40 days. Um, Noah and his family uh, floated around for 150 days. But then in, in, in Genesis chapter 8, it says 40 days later, Noah opened a window. He was preparing himself to disembark. So it, was, it was supposed to be a new world, a new order. Forty days is always a day of a, a time of preparation. Um, we go to Exodus, and it's not, just, it's not just days, but there is the 40 number that appears quite often. You think of Moses. Moses lived his life in 40-year blocks. To those of you 80 years old, Moses was just starting at 80. Um, his first 40 years, he started as an Egyptian, raised in Pharaoh's court. His next 40 years, he spent being faithfully married to a Midianite woman, a black woman, by the way. Um, here was a Jew married to a black woman. Um, later, his sister would get leprosy because she was a bigot and made comments about that. Um, but he lived the next 40 years in the Midian desert, right, preparing, preparing for what God was calling him to do, and he next spent the next 40 years leading his people. But you see, 40 is always a period of preparation. And it's interesting, Moses goes into the desert with his people, and he goes up on the mountain to receive the covenant of God. The people are preparing themselves to re receive God's covenant. Guess how long Moses was on the mountain? 40 days. He comes back down with the covenant of the Lord. It's always a time of preparation. And this carries on throughout Scripture, even Jesus, before he begins his public ministry. I say his public ministry because Jesus, being very God, was incarnated in the flesh. And you've got to understand, Jesus' whole life was ministry. Even while he was a carpenter, I say that to those of you who go to work every single day. Um, Jesus' life was ministry. But before he began his public ministry... He went into the desert to prepare himself, and he spent 40 days. 40 is always a time of preparation. So now we come to the resurrection of Christ, 
And Jesus appeared to his disciples for 40 days. So the question then is, what was he, what was he preparing them for? Because that's what this means. He was preparing them for Pentecost. Remember, Jesus said, it is good for you that I go away because unless I go, my comforter, my spirit cannot come to be with you. And Jesus said his spirit was a better thing than his presence. We're like, but I I don't understand how that works. It's because God's spirit is in all places at all times. Jesus, in earthly form, was in Galilee at one time. And great things happen. And so he's preparing his disciples. He's 40 days. He's preparing his disciples for Pentecost. But here's what's amazing. Pentecost didn't happen 40 days after Jesus' resurrection. It happened 10 days after his ascension. So there was 40 days of preparation, 10 days of waiting. He told his disciples, go into Jerusalem and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. They waited 10 days. Until the day of Pentecost arrived, Acts chapter 2. So there was 40 days of preparation, 10 days of waiting, and then God's spirit was poured out upon all flesh. Peter would preach from Joel. And as a church, that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you in this. Beginning this Sunday, and really we're seven days into it, you just didn't know it. And so for these next few weeks, we're going to be in a time of preparation. And just like Jesus showed himself as a resurrected Savior, we're going to look at what resurrection means for these 40 days, for these these weeks that lead up to that point. So this week, we're going to deal with tradition. Isn't that a great way to start a sermon series? Like Nate says, how do I pick songs about that? Uh, Tradition. Um, And I suggested Fiddler on the Roof. He said no. I was vetoed, right? But we're going to deal with tradition. Next week, so we're resurrecting tradition this week. Next week, we're resurrecting sanctification. The week after that, we're resurrecting hope. The week after that, we are resurrecting, uh, what is it? We're resurrecting judgment. Show up for that one. The week after that, we're resurrecting victory. The week after that, it's just, it's going to be a great time. And then on May 10th, Pentecost Sunday is May 20th. On May 10th, 10 days before Pentecost, we're going to begin to wait. You're going to hear me talk about this. 40 days of preparation, 10 days of waiting. You're like, what does that mean? I'll be honest with you. I don't know, and it scares me to death. But every day for 10 days, we're going to meet. I'm going to invite some of you to fast. We're going to pray. You're like, well, are you going to have prayer lists? No, because we want to hear from God, not tell him what we need. I'm not saying prayer lists are bad things. I'm saying we're waiting, just like the disciples. The disciples really didn't know what they were waiting for. Well, what what are we supposed to pray about? I don't know. What's it going to look like? I'm not sure. Is it going to be awkward? Absolutely. (laughs) Right? but we're going to wait. Maybe it's in silence. I don't know. Maybe it's someone praying out in a moment. I don't know. But for 10 days, we're going to wait, and we're going to be patient on God because he's been patient with us. 40 days of preparation, 10 days of waiting, and Pentecost Sunday on May 20th. You with me? I'm going to lead you there. Um, But I'm leading not in front of, I'm leading along with because I don't know what it looks like. So we begin our time of preparation, and here we are in Easter, and Jesus has appeared. You've heard the passage. I read the passage earlier this morning, Um, and and I want you to keep your Bibles open to this passage, because we're going to be in this passage for two weeks, um, these first 11 verses. And so you can keep it open, but but, uh, again, a reminder that Easter is just, a day, but we celebrate the event, and this is why one of my favorite lines from Pope John Paul II, a phenomenal man of God, he said, do not, do not give yourself over to despair. We are the Easter people, and resurrect, or and hallelujah is our song. We are the Easter people. We don't live in a moment. We live in a reality of Easter. And he says, and hallelujah is our song. Do you understand what that means? 
He's talking about the, the place in Scripture where that word is used. It's used in the Revelation at the very end of your Bibles. And it's, a, it's what we would call an eschatological term. Uh, this, it's, it's about these endings, right? And Revelation is about an ending of one dispensation, but the opening of something brand new. It's the beginning. And hallelujah is the song that we sing. That word appears nowhere else in Scripture except in this portion all the way at the end. But here's what Easter does. Easter takes the resurrection and the celebration of the Lamb that is way out here, and it moves it into the present. And so when we say hallelujah, what we are saying is uh, the future kingdom of God is coming to my life right now, and so we anticipate it with that song hallelujah. Church, do not give yourself to despair. We are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. Isn't that great news? This is who we are. And, and, and so in the midst of it, when it seems like the world gives us reason to despair, we say hallelujah because we know there is more. And we know that Jesus Christ is bringing it to fruition in our life even now. Re resurrection defines for us the hope that the gospel declares. Apart from resurrection, we have only a martyr for a founder, only a figurehead for a savior, and only a morality for a salvation. But we do not come alive by being moral. We come alive by being resurrected. And this is important for us. In the resurrection, our martyred founder is vindicated and his message becomes more than that of mere morality. Did you know you were not saved to be moral? You're like, well, what else is there? Don't get me wrong. Morality is part of your salvation, but you are not saved to be moral. You are saved to be alive. That's what resurrection is. And, and there is a life that flows out from that point. Um, uh, but, but salvation is more than that of mere morality. His message becomes words of life, and his mis ministry becomes the way that that life is expressed. We view Jesus through the lens of the resurrection, and in the same way, Jesus views us through the resurrection. We view him through what he did. He views us by what we're becoming. What a blessing that is. His life was poured into the grave and raised to life from the despair of death so that our lives could flow out of the grave and pour into abundant, overflowing life. This is amazing. This is what Easter means. And this has been handed down to us from generation to generation to generation. Every day that we live in the present reality of the Easter event is another day in which we live hanging on to the very thing that Jesus himself gave us. Have you ever been handed something of value? I have a box in my, in my, my bedroom underneath one of, in the drawer underneath my bed. And, um, and it's a, a box my grandmother gave me. I never knew my grandfather kid, K-I-D-D, -D, if you understand why I am the way that I am. And uh, I never knew my grandfather kid. He died before, um, before I was born, and, um, and he served in World War II. And he hated the fact that he had served. Not that he had served his country, but that he had done the things that he did in service, and rightful service to his country, but he hated war. He hated war. Um, and I, I've got his box. I've got his bronze star. I've got his ration books. I've got the newspaper articles where his unit did surgery on their skunk mascot and took the, uh, the stink glands out. I wish we could do that with our children. Right, I've got all of these, I've got all of these things. And it's been handed to me. And you know what makes this valuable? Is they were his. Easter has been handed to us from Christ Himself. It's his. It's not ours, but he's given it to us. Wouldn't it be profanity if I took those ration books out and I told the kids, you know what, just here, tear these perforations, do what you want with them. Make a paper airplane out of the newspaper articles. 
Can you imagine? You want to play with these medals? It's a bronze star. I bet you it could be a Chinese throwing star. Wouldn't that be horror? What a disgrace. It would not only disgrace this country, it would disgrace my grandfather. It would be, it would be profanity. Do you know we've been handed down a tradition that we are not allowed to mess with? It came to us from Christ himself. And what gives it value? Christ himself gives it value. So think for a moment uh, of, of the most valuable things. I did some research. By research, I meant I Googled something and looked for like 10 minutes. So, I, And here's what I Googled. I Googled most expensive autographs. Okay, any ideas? Any ideas? What's that? Otis Wagner? That may have been on the list. Babe Ruth. This went to auction some years ago. How about this? $388,000. I don't know if you know this. I haven't bought baseballs in a while because um, I don't want to disgrace girls by saying I throw like a girl, but maybe girls throw like me. I don't know. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I play catch... Um, I play catch on the computer, not in real life. Um, so, uh, so I haven't bought a baseball, but I don't know. Is this the going rate for a baseball? No. You see, it's got some value to it because of who held it. Um, uh, here's one. 47 copies were made of the Emancipation Proclama Proclamation. 26, to our knowledge, survive. Signed by Abraham Lincoln. Wouldn't you like to own one of those? Now, this is something I could get my teeth into. But not for, oh, not for that price, $3.7 million. Um, and here's, here's the last one of this little bit. Um, the, George Washington's Acts of Congress. Do you ever sign the insides of your books in case, in case this book is lost, return to George Washington? That's what this is. This came out of his library. Yeah, here's, the, here's the value, $9.8 million for a book. Okay, so what would happen... If I got my hands on this book, and just like, just like good old George, I, I wanted to make sure it didn't get lost. If you find this book, please return it to Jeff Jewett. So I signed my name to the inside. Would it go for $9.8 million? No, no. See the problem? Tradition matters. Tradition matters. We've got to understand that. Uh, maybe this isn't your thing. Maybe art. I do art. I like art. I just don't like Picasso. Here, Picasso is in a particular time of his life. Guess what period Picasso's in? Oh, you guys are so smart. Um, and, and, and he came up with the best names for his, his pieces. Do you know what he called this one? Woman with folded arms. I just genius. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a mind. What a mind. Um, and, uh, and here's what that sold for. $55 million dollars. Right, a million dollars. Um, that's what this dude sold for. But it sold for that some years ago. And so if you add inflationary rates to it, it looks more like $74 million today. Okay, um, uh, Van Gogh, uh, one, of my, one of my favorites. And of, of Van Gogh, this is my favorite piece. I, I love, I, some of you are correcting me. It's Van Gogh. <laughs> no, you're wrong. Um, uh, this is my favorite piece. I love the purple and the blue and that single white iris. Um, this one also is brilliantly titled Irises. Um, and this one sold back in the late 1800s for, uh, for about 53, just a reasonable price, in the 1800s for 53.9 million. Um, but if you did the inflation and all of that, you're looking at about 100.3 million dollars and then in 2017 there's da vinci making jesus look like a chick <laughs> sorry <laughs> i mean he does jesus is in renaissance garb this is called salvatore mundi so he was a little more creative savior of the world here's this this globe the sphere it's supposed to be the cosmos and jesus of course is, has his fingers crossed uh, referring to the dual nature fully God, fully man, um, and he's wearing Renaissance garb and, um, and looks, looks a, an awful lot like M Mona Lisa's weird brother. Um, but, uh, 
But this was recently found and restored, and it sold, and it blew all other records out of the water. Here's what it sold for, $450 million. Okay, so what makes these things valuable? Where do they come from? Who owns them? Imagine, you remember the movie, the movie version of Mr. Bean? Some of you are like, no, no, I do not remember that movie. Um, it's a brilliant movie. And in there, he's moving a piece of art called Whistler's Mother, and he sneezes on Whistler's mother's face. And the paint runs, and he tries to clean it off, and it ends up with a bare spot, and so he draws a face <laughs> on there, right? Can you imagine what would happen if you did that to Salvatore Mundi? Its value would be considerably less. You, you understand? Maybe the thing you put value in isn't so much something like this. Maybe it's an experience. Here's mine. Maybe it's walking the path. This is, this is very personal for me. Maybe it's walking the path, the cobblestone pathway that took uh, Martin Luther to Wittenberg Chapel. Maybe, he, he, here it is. I was, I was weird. I recorded my feet. There it is. Wittenberg, Germany. It's full of Germans. It was weird. And there it is. There's the chapel. 95 theses on that door. Hmm. It was all barricaded off. Angela Merkel was inside the chapel at the time, and so we didn't get as close as I would hope. But what would happen if I went up to those chapel doors and I nailed up 87 theses? <laughs> you see, you see, there you go. I would have gotten arrested, shot that particular day. Um, <laughs> but you see, tradition matters. Tradition matters. And the value of something is based on the integrity of how it is received. And I cannot say this enough. The gospel comes to us from Jesus Christ. We do not mess with it. We have been handed something which comes directly from the mouth of Jesus. Um, we spent, and I want to explain this briefly, we spent the last two days dealing with um, credentialing in the church of the Nazarene. Doesn't that sound just so uplifting? But it really is a phenomenal process. Um, we talk about ordination. Ordination is a tradition that goes back to Acts chapter 13 and even further back. We see it. It's this laying on of hands. And, and, and Dr. Cunningham was the one who ordained me. Dr. Cunningham, because of his Parkinson's, can no longer move. And when he was ordaining me, he was just beginning to shake. And I remember the moment when he placed his hands upon my head. And he says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I ordain you for sacred ministry for the rest of your life. And you see, what he was doing was he was standing there on behalf of the church, not the church of the Nazarene, not the local church, not the, the head of, of, of a denomination. He was standing there as, as representative of the bride of Christ because as Jesus taught his disciples, what his disciples did then was they taught the next generation. We see this. We see in what Paul, uh, when, when the disciples themselves lay hands upon Paul and Barnabas and commission them to a task. And even Paul himself lays hands upon Timothy and commissions him. And these first disciples laid hands on these church fathers, Origen and Ignatius and Athanasius, on down through the centuries to Augustine and, and, and Aquinas and so many others, so that the tradition, the tradition means that through the ages, when, my, when those hands were laid upon my head, it was as if Christ himself was doing it. There's integrity there, and we need to preserve that integrity. It's profound. It's relevant. It's real. Um, here's the problem is we have, we have gotten such a bad taste in our mouth with this concept of tradition because of the way that we've misunderstood it. So, Fiddler on the Roof, 
some of you are singing the song, tradition, tradition, right? And then a modulation, tradition, right? It's, it's good. And, and, and part of the movie is, is, is asking this question. The whole, the, the whole topic is about why is the fiddler on the roof? Well, the answer is because he's always fiddled on the roof. That's the answer. Why is, well, but that isn't an answer, but that's what he's always done. You see, there is a difference between what we would call tradition and traditionalism. And in that instance, we're talking about traditionalism. Yar, Yaroslav, uh, Yaroslav, oh, let's see if I can get his name. Yaroslav Pelikan, a good Slavic name. There you go. He was a Yale professor and a, a theology teacher and a brilliant thinker. Here's what he says. Tradition is the living faith of dead people to which we must add our chapter uh, while we have the gift of life, whereas traditionalism is the dead faith of living people who fear that if anything changes, the whole enterprise will crumble. So let me shorten it for you. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And the problem is, is we've taken the dead faith of repetition for the sake of repeating it, and we have, we have assigned that to the role of tradition. And that's wrong. That's wrong. We have this idea that if we change this thing, the whole enterprise will crumble. Now, that's traditionalism. We have tradition. We have something more. And we've got to understand the difference. The gospel is given to us by tradition. And we don't mess with that. And so, uh, so the proclamation, the word itself, the way that we present it in some instances is sacred. It's divinely given from Jesus himself. So the message is not given to us to innovate. And to recreate, a comment was made yesterday, um, uh, Dr. Bob Broadbanks is our regional director, our, 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 our director for Canada and, and the United States, this North America region, and he was there speaking, and he made a comment about um, denominations at about 100 years old, which is, we're a little bit over 100 years old, you guys look great. Um, and uh, he, he said that, that, uh, that most cases, these denominations crumble at about the 100-year mark. Um, and then he said something that we got, we got into a conversation later, and, <laughs> and I said in what was just profound humility, I said, now Bob Broadbank said something that I'm sure he wanted me to clarify. <laughs> I said, I, he said something wrong, that he needs me to clarify for him. He'll appreciate this. He may not ever know it. But um, he said of the denomination, he said, about this time, while we are reinventing ourselves. And I said, no, 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 no. We are rediscovering ourselves. There is a fundamental difference. We do not invent, reinvent, invigorate, or, or mess with the gospel. Now, the way that we deliver that, okay, we can be creative with that, but it is not our job to be creative with the word of God. It's not our job. And I don't care how old uh, of, of a Christian you are or how young of a preacher you are, you do not change the word of God as it has been handed down to us through the generations. This is the word of God of Christ, and we hold it dearly. This was, was brought to my mind as a conviction when I was sitting on my back deck, and I had my Bible open, and I was reading, and my son comes up, and he starts to ask me a question. Hey, Dad. And then he saw my Bible open, and he said, oh, sorry, you're working. I won't bug you. I was just reading my Bible. But he somehow had thought that the word of God for me was a task. And I've got to tell you this morning, I love the word of God. 
I love the word of God, and I want to give it to you with integrity. And I want you to test my mettle on this point. Because if I'm wrong, I want to fix it. This is God's word, and it's been handed down to us from Christ through the ages to us today. We don't mess with the word of God. This is what tradition is. And can I tell you, I know some of you don't believe this, but I hold tradition very dear. Very, very dear. You're like, well, we need some more of the songs that, that Nate did this morning. Okay, you know what? Even those songs are new. You know, we've got a problem. If our old hymns are as old as you, then what's old? The hymn or you? See, we've got a problem. Quit getting such a short view. We've got old hymns. You wouldn't like the old hymns. We've tried it. The 1700s, the Wesleys, oh my goodness. You guys don't like them. Those are old hymns, and we hear about it. Right? We've got a longer tradition than 100 years old. We've got a longer tradition than the Wesley brothers in the 1700s. Church, we have a longer tradition than Martin Luther 500 years ago. We have a tradition that takes us clear back to Christ himself. So I want to introduce you to some sacred art. Some sacred art. Here it is. This is old. This is old. And with some of the sacred art, here's what you'll see. They are sermons in picture. Oh, my goodness. It's profound. Um, uh, they, I, I, I said I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do this and just step out into the deep water if that's okay. It's, I'm not asking your permission. Um, I call this sacred art in antiquity, back to the time of Christ. This is, these are called icons. Don't hear idol. Hear icon. It's a different word. An icon means image, and it comes out of the Greek translation of Genesis, that we are the icon, the image of God. It's that same. It's the same word. This is an image. It's not a venerated image. It is an image that tells a story. It preaches a sermon. So I want to walk you through this sermon. This, this image is called the harrowing of Hades. Isn't that a great title? Picasso could have learned something. Um, here's how it starts. Here's the risen Christ. Here he is, exalted. The risen Christ in new garments, no longer clothed in the sin of humanity, but reclothed in the righteousness that is his. And, and so here he is, exultant. And something you will see in this sacred art, there's no shadows. There's no shadowing. You notice that? It looks very two-dimensional. You know why? Because where there is shadowing, we're supposed to, it, it, it's for our eyes. We are supposed to examine the art. But in this case, the art examines us. It, it, it tells the story, and the story is an examination of our life. So here he is. Here's Jesus, the resurrected Christ, examining our life, saying, are you living in this life that I have come to bring? But notice he's lifting two people out of the grave, out of these tombs. It's Adam and Eve, the representatives of all of humanity. In Adam and Eve, we sinned. And so who does he raise in this? In this, he raises Adam and Eve out of death, representing that he's raising all of humanity. And then underneath, you'll notice there's the old goat himself. There's the devil. And he is bound. He is bound, and, and, and all of this darkness, that's, that's the, the power of death, that's Haiti, that's, and, and notice it's in disarray. And get this, you, you see those two, those two images where Jesus' feet rest? Those are the gates of hell, and they're in shambles. But see, this tells a story, and it's a story that has been handed down to us, and it's a story we hear right from Scripture. And I want to tell some of that story today. Because here's, here's the way Paul says it. He says, now I would remind you, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel that I preach to you. Sometimes we need a reminder. Sometimes we need reminded. I would remind you of the gospel which I preach to you, which you received. 
you received it, and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Whew. I want to go there, but that's next week. So hang on to that. Um, and, and he says, he continues in this, for I delivered to you as of first importance. Here's the most important thing. Um, and and there's, this, there's this idea that we need to make the gospel simplistic. That's wrong, church. That is wrong. We have a Bible that is chock full of stuff that we've got to deal with. A simplistic gospel is different than a simple gospel. Do not simplify the gospel. Uh, the Reverend John Stott, in some great flourish once, was asked, he, theologian um, uh, of the Archdiocese, I believe, in, in, in England, and, and phenomenal mind, he was asked once uh, to, uh, to simplify the gospel. And he's speaking to a room full of men, and he says, gentlemen, I do not want a simple gospel. I want the whole thing. What a great rhetorical flourish that was. Um, uh, but here, Paul is saying there is, a, a, there is a gospel that is of first importance. And so here's what you get. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. That's what this shows. Christ died for our sins. I don't know if you know this. I pray that you do. But he didn't just die for your sin or a sin. He died for all sins. This is big for us to understand because whether you accept the grace that he gives or not, he still died for your sins. And what an insult to be given a gift but to never use it. Do you know you cheapen, if you do not receive what Christ has given, you cheapen the cross. You cheapen the sacrifice because he didn't do it for the fun of it. He didn't do it because it was Friday. Well, it's Friday. Let's... Uh, Let's do the cross. We do the cross on Friday. That's not why he did it. He did it for our sins. So we receive it because he did it. And we complete the cross in our accepting of it. Read Hebrews. Those are hard words. That, that somehow the work of Christ is incomplete unless we receive it. We make Christ's work incomplete. And so he died for our sins. What, are, what does that mean, Pastor? Is it what I've done? Yes. Is it, is it the thing behind it that's compelled me to do it? You know, your sin isn't just what you do. Sin is also the thing that compels you to do it. We've got to understand that. Because if we only deal with what we've done, we're going to keep doing it again and again and again and again. It's going to become a trap for us. Uh, you're like, how do I get out of that trap? Uh, two ways. Talk to me after the service or come next week. Because we're going to deal with that. Um, sanctification by God's grace is his answer. Um, and so, so this is what sin is dealing with. Sin is dealing with all of this. And it was all piled upon Christ. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. Um, you've got a lot of garbage out there that's giving you lots of theories about Christ. About Jesus' death, he swooned on the cross. The, uh, the Muslims, they're wrong. I, I don't know that this is true. Maybe Allah is just a na made-up name. I suspect Allah is the name of a demon. Um, I don't know. But the Muslims will teach you that, that Christ swooned on the cross. That is, he just got really tired and emaciated and weak. And he looked like he was dead. He really wasn't. That's Hebrew. Um, you hear things like, and he got into the tomb, and, and, uh, and, and he just recovered in three days enough to be able to move a big old stone after he had been flagellated and crucified and, yeah, um, stupid. There's, a, a, there's a, a theory out there that he was raised spiritually. Well, his body is still in the tomb, but he was raised spiritually. Garbage, garbage. It's absolute garbage. He was raised bodily. He was put in the grave. 
He was put in the grave. We've got to understand this. He was dead. But this grave means so much more than just that tomb. It means the condition of, de- of sin and death itself. He died for our sins, but he went, he, 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 was, he was put into the ground for our sins. There is this weird passage in 1 Peter that talks about Jesus after his crucifixion going into the, the bowels of death and releasing the captives from the day of, days of Noah. You're like, what does that mean? I don't know. I wasn't there. But what I do know is he entered fully into death and did continue to work even in his death. He entered into the grave that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, that he was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with Scripture, raised to bodily life, raised to resurrection, raised as the first fruits of what we will receive. This is our redemption, church. This is our witness. And if we do not witness to this, we have nothing to pass on to the world. We have no hope if we have no hope in the resurrection, period. The resurrection is where our heart beats, where every, every bit of who we are resides. We, we, we look to the resurrection as that key moment. And here's what's amazing in the resurrection is that Jesus didn't just raise and then drop these words into a text somewhere and say, hey, just tell everyone I was raised, um, but you don't, you don't really need to see me like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. Let's not do it like that. No, he showed himself. This is part of the tradition. Remember Jesus said, you will be my witnesses? We're like, well, that, that's about evangelization. Well, it's totally about evangelization, but it's also not about evangelization. He's saying, you're going to see me and you're going to tell people. Because I don't know if you know this, but if someone was dead and they got up out of the tomb, you would probably tell someone. Right? I mean, you tell them. I, I mean, we make so much work. We, we, we place so much emphasis about making disciples. Um, we, we've got to have, we've got to, we've got to, and discipleship is good, but we've got to, we've got to get people saved. We've got to go out and we've got to get, and that's all right and good. But, but here's the thing. Think about it in terms of marriage. Do you ever have to explain to a newly married couple how to make a baby? No. Yet we spend a lot of time telling people that are supposed to be in love with Jesus how they need to make a baby and when they should do it and what's the methodology of it and let's make a textbook. Man, if I brought a textbook in uh, for the other uh, side of this story, you would fire me and rightfully so. Right, But we spend so much time there. Here's the idea is we are in love with Jesus. We have been handed a, a firsthand witness and we've got to tell people. This is resurrection, and this is what Jesus says in this passage, or Paul says to us in this passage, that he appeared. He appeared um, to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. You can go back to the Gospels and read those moments. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive. Do you understand what's happening? These are people who saw him, who touched him. And you say, well, that's 2,000 years ago. But look at the change, change in the disciples' lives. Many of these men were cowards. That's, that's how I know I was qualified to be a disciple, <laughs> right? I mean, they, were, they, they, they needed some work, and, uh, and, and, they, and Jesus appears to them, and every one of them to a person, to a person, died proclaiming the resurrection of Christ. Not, not dying up to their deathbeds, but that's to happen, but died as martyrs because of the resurrection of Christ. The only one who seemed to escape that was John. Um, and John lived into his 90s, we think, which was unheard of at that time, but he was dipped in scalding oil. He just refused to die. They tried, um, but it didn't work. And so he lived into his 90s, scarred from head to toe. And isn't it amazing? You say, well, it was a made-up story. It was a lie. Not one of them broke. I wouldn't die for a lie. Not for a minute. I may be able to convince you of something and be, uh, be, uh, sell you a line. But man, if you, start, if you start pulling my fingernails out or just tickling the bottom of my feet, 
I am totally going to confess. But these things, horrible things happened, and every one of them died to a person. What would cause that? Just kidding, guys. <laughs> Something so ridiculous as resurrection. You would, someone would cave. No one caved. 500 people saw him at once. I read a book this week about how they believe, well, on that hillside, <laughs> no joke, on that hillside, there was a mushroom that grew. They were talking about a group psycholo- or psychedelic hallucination. Hallucin- hallucin- hallucination. Um, I had some mushrooms before I started. Um, but uh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, but, but, but isn't it amazing? They all shared the same hallucination. How does that work? That, 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 that doesn't work like that. 500 at the same time. And he says, most of whom are still alive. Do you know what he's saying? Go and talk to them. You see, this is an eyewitness account, and it's been handed down to us. I love reading the works of a man by the name of Origen. He lived between, uh, between 30 and uh, maybe 30 A.D. and 100 A.D., somewhere in there, in the life of Christ or just thereafter. And he, was, he, he interacted with the disciples. And he talks about how convinced they were and what they said. And this has been handed down to us through the generations. Do you know what this means? That means their witness becomes your witness. We can say with confidence, Jesus Christ is risen. We can say that because we have, we have brothers and sisters who have seen it, and it has been handed down to us with integrity. Uh, we can trace that line from the first century to the 21st century. Church, what you have is a tradition that is more than traditionalism. You have something that is the dead faith of the living, or the living faith of the dead now breathing in you. It's their faith now handed down through the generations. And, and just like we wouldn't sign our name to a baseball that belonged to Babe Ruth or change a picture that Da Vinci painted, we will not sign our name to the Word of God. We will not sign our name to the tradition, but we will add our chapter, our participation to it because this is a living faith. And we, we, uh, we are part of this. So here's what has happened is through the ages, this has been given to us. But right now, church, you have been entrusted with it. God trusts you with this witness. Isn't that a heavy thought? There's a verse I want to read as we prepare our hearts for, uh, as we prepare for uh, closing this morning, but Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is Paul's protege. Paul, Paul laid his hands on Timothy and ordained him, and, and, and Timothy became a pastor, and he says, here's what he says, 1 Timothy 1, this I charge to you. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Wouldn't it be something if we called out people's names? They have perverted the gospel. There are, they, they have tried to sign their name to a document that does not belong to them, and they have perverted the gospel. They have done it behind pulpits. They have done it in pastoral offices. They have done it with the sanctity of Christ upon his life. And let me tell you their names. Paul, or Timothy, I am charging you, and I am entrusting you with this which I have had. And then in 2 Timothy, again, Paul is writing, but this is a, such a sweet letter. In 2 Timothy, you can hear the execution coming down the hall. This is Paul's last letter. And he reaches out to his son in the faith, to Timothy. And, uh, and, and as he reaches out to him, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is the judge, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, 
Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, consumer hearts, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring suffering, doing the work of an evangelist. And then he says these words, fulfill your ministry. So now church, this has been my burden handed down to me from the laying on of hands, from Jesus to the disciples, from the disciples through the generations. And I, I'm telling you now, as my hands are extended over you, this word of God that has been given to me, I give to you. I entrust you. And I charge you in the same way to preach this word, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all patience and long suffering. It belongs to you. It's not your signature because it's not your gospel. It's his good news. So do it in the tradition, the faith, and the, uh, the, the long-standing history that has been handed down to you, but do it with the confidence of knowing that Christ loves his church and he will not let her fail. And if we hold on to this truth without itching ears and without a, a, a perverted conscience and we do what God has called us to do, guess what? He will preserve his church. And he will raise us up to be a bride, uh, spotless, without blemish or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because this is what we have been handed as of first importance, that Jesus Christ died for your sins in accordance with Scripture, was buried, but was raised again on the third day in accordance with Scripture, and has appeared. Though our eyes do not see him even now, we will behold him. Until then, we hang on what he has entrusted to us. This is what faith is. And so now I give it to you. I'm going to invite you to stand. And we're going to sing just the chorus today. And here's what I want you to know. We sang these words earlier today. Here's what I want you to know. If this gospel is not familiar to you, Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and was raised again to bring you to life, today is your becoming. You are becoming what he wants you to be. You can accept the gift that he has given. You can perfect the blood of Christ by receiving that which it was shed for. You become part of his body. It's profound. Today is your becoming. You're like, well, what do I need to do? Just receive it. Is there a prayer? Sometimes we pray a prayer. Uh, we talk about confessing our sins. God, I confess my sins to you. I receive the grace that you have given me, and I belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. You can pray something like that. That's fine. Uh, but today, I suspect I'm speaking mostly to the church. I suspect today I'm reminding you the same way that Paul reminded the church in Corinth, that you have received something value. Hang on to it, but don't hoard it, because the charge of this gospel is a charge to preach. We, we don't ordain everyone, but today you are being ordained for a sacred task.